And I want to share with you guys today something that has been on my heart lately. Um, something that has been a paradigm shift for me. That has been really blessed. And uh, a question that I get a lot. And that I haven't had a great answer for until recently. Or not a complete answer. Or not an answer I felt good about. And that question is this. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What is my purpose? Why do I exist? Probably ever, every human being who's ever lived has asked a version of those questions. I have asked those questions. Probably you have asked those questions. Why am I here? And maybe you haven't asked them out loud, but in your heart, I'm sure that you have wondered, why do I exist? But what is the answer? Bruce Lee famously said, Bruce Lee, the, the, the martial arts master, he said, the meaning of life is that it is to be lived. And that sounds nice, but all due respect to Mr. Lee, what does that even mean? Right? Here's another one. The author Joseph Campbell. He said, the meaning of life is whatever you ascribe it to be. Being alive is the meaning. So in other words, make it up for yourself and then pretend that that's good enough and stop asking such big questions. That's really what he says. A little less due respect to him. How about Aristotle? The ancient Greek philosopher, he said happiness is the meaning and purpose of life and the whole aim and end of human existence. And that's still a really common answer in our culture, right? Follow your heart and do what makes you happy and that is your purpose. But at the end of the day, all of those and others fail to answer the real question behind the questions of life's meaning. Do I exist for a real transcendent purpose? Was I made for something more or do I not mean anything at all? And I think if we're really honest, all of our hearts are crying out for more. All of us know we were made for something more than just living or feeling good or even doing good with what we have. We know that we were made for a reason, and that's why we ask the question, what is the meaning of life? I think there are four meanings of life that people arrive at. And I want to talk about those and tell you why three of those don't work. And then I want to tell you why the fourth one is the real meaning of life. The first false meaning, the first insufficient meaning of life is survival. And this isn't really a meaning of life at all. It's a lack of purpose entirely. It's living one day to the next and just getting through the day. It is... Resigning ourselves to the idea that we are just an animal caught in the middle of a universe spinning chaotically out of control. And if I can just get through today, maybe I can have a little fun tonight. And then I'm going to just wake up and do it all tomorrow until I die. Now, some people live their whole lives that way. And that is a really brutal way to live. Survival. Here's the next insufficient purpose that people cling to. Number two. The self. Self. I think there are three main streams of living for self, maybe more. I'm going to hit these really quickly, and these are deep waters, but just bear with me. These are the three that come to my mind when I think about living for self. The first one is hedonism. Maybe you've heard that word, hedonism. It's, it, it's the idea that pleasure is Purpose. That's A under self. The idea that pleasure is purpose. That's becoming more and more common. It can be summarized by the phrase, if, if it feels good, do it. It's placing pleasure as the highest good and aim in life. Whether that be drug-induced or sexual or food or drink or video games or cars or music or whatever makes you feel good, the hedonist says that is the meaning of life. Eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Maybe you've heard that. This is sometimes also called Epicureanism because of the Greek philosopher Epicurus who, who championed the idea about 2,300 years ago. But it's more ancient even than that. The author of Ecclesiastes, who the book of Ecclesiastes, if you didn't know this, is, is this, it's an experiment. It's where he takes all these different worldly ideas of the meaning of life and he takes them to their logical conclusion. And he begins with chapter two with these words. He says, I said in my heart, 
Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. What he found and what most people find who try to make pleasure the meaning of their lives is that it is a hollow and lonely way to live. And it's not real purpose at all. Because in the end, you still die, having felt nice for a little while, but with nothing to show for it. The next common version of self-purpose is something called existentialism. And, and the, the approach of the existentialist to the question of the meaning of life is basically define your own purpose. That's B there. Define your own purpose. Define your own purpose. Not seek to discover your purpose, but make it up for yourself. Let me give you, I'm going to give you a generous definition first. And then I'll give you the real definition. The, re- the generous definition with regards to the purpose of life, what the existentialist I think would say is that human beings are unique free agents to which we would say, okay, yeah. But then they would say there are no certain moral or ethical limits. And without the ability to know true purpose or the true nature of things, we have to settle on what feels best to us. And therefore it is up to us to decide what our purpose is. That's the heart of that Joseph Campbell quote I gave you earlier. He said, the meaning of life is whatever you ascribe it to be, being alive is the meaning. That is an existentialist cry. And this is what lies at the foundation of self-improvement as the meaning of life, or of personal success and achievement as the meaning of life. The problem is that these are made up. They're concocted meanings. They're not discovered ones. They're not real. And at the end of the day, what that really means is, for the existentialist, Purpose doesn't exist. So make one up. Because you need to feel purpose, but you can't really know. If you have to, just delude yourself into thinking that your life matters and pretend that things do have a meaning. And then when your conscience nags at you in the middle of the night and reminds you that finite beings cannot give themselves a transcendent purpose, just ignore that and just do whatever you want. And you can add to that this, the, the materialist, atheist idea that the universe came into being by accident and then by evolution, and, which is also accident, and that all there is is what we can touch and measure. And then you run right up to the edge of nihilism, which is the idea that nothing means anything. And so existentialism doesn't ultimately save us from being meaningless. It just covers it up and covers up our nihilistic dread with the illusion of meaning. Here's the third stream of self-meaning. This is maybe a brand new concept to you, and I'm going to hit it very quickly. It's this idea of Randian objectivism. There was an author named Ayn Rand who was, came out of the Soviet Union and saw how messed up that was. And, and so she came up with a philosophy of life that she called objectivism. And, and really what that posits is that self-interest is the purpose of your life. So that's C there. It's self-interest as purpose. Self-interest. And that sounds similar to hedonism and existentialism, but it's different enough that I wanted to mention it. She described her philosophy like this. She said, this is the concept of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. The goal of this kind of self-purpose is not raw pleasure, and it's not up to each individual to define their own purpose. The goal is reaching toward being your best and reaching your full potential and fully activating your reason in order to live your best life. And it's not necessarily the most pleasurable life. Rand would say, no, that's not right. The most pleasurable life is usually a worse life in the sense of physical pleasure, but in order to to seek happiness by doing the things that we know in our hearts to be best to do. That's how she would describe it. And I'm trying to be generous. That's what Aristotle kind of said. He he would probably agree with a lot of what she said. And it's really interesting because it's a lot more, it's a lot more robust and grounded than hedonism or existentialism. But at the end of the day, that kind of purpose doesn't last either because all of us are going to die. And the best men who ever lived also died. And if all we are is to live and die, it doesn't matter how, how we become. It doesn't matter what we become. It doesn't matter what we achieve. Because in the end, eventually, 
Their character, their reason, their greatest accomplishments are all lost to history anyway. And so can we really say that that kind of purpose is really purpose at all if it doesn't go beyond us into something real? Can we really claim that to be the meaning of life? And I don't think we can. I think we shouldn't. I think that's defeated by its own logic. All of us know there has to be more to this life than simply living your best life. And so we go on to the next category with number three. This is a noble cause. A noble cause. A noble cause. Most people recognize that living for themselves is empty and lonely and hollow in the end. We feel it. We know it in a way that goes deeper than our reason. Maybe we can't always explain it, but we know if I am the center of the universe, what a messed up universe this is. And so we have this deep and abiding sense that we need to live for something more, that we were made for more than just ourselves. And so many people find a noble cause to pursue. It's something bigger than us. It it gives us a larger framework for our actions and our attitudes. And this attracts a lot of decent, good people because it gives a really powerful sense of purpose. This can include so many different things. It can include living for others. That sounds really nice. Um, And it is good. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's not enough. Or living for family. Or living for your company or the people you work with and who work for you and who you work for. Or living for your country, making your country your purpose. Or your political, your political cause. Or your church. Or living for justice or trying to make peace the purpose of your life. Or caring for the poor or whatever other good and noble thing. That's not enough. Sometimes people combine several of those things together and they pursue that combination of things as the purpose of their lives. But notice all of those things are good. Like I said, it's right and virtuous to care for other people and to provide for your family and to defend your country and to build up your church and strive for justice and feed the hungry and uplift the poor. But none of those things is enough to be the purpose of our lives. Here's why. There are two problems with the idea of making a noble cause the ultimate purpose of your life. Firstly, A, every cause is temporary. All of them. Every cause is temporary. And temporary causes cannot provide us transcendent actual meaning. They give us the sense of meaning and the perception of meaning. But when you start to really consider and scrutinize them, they fall apart. For example, Roman soldiers... They gave their lives, some of them, not only for their country or to the Roman Empire, but sometimes they gave their lives completely to the Roman Empire. These would be young men who sometimes from basically the, the time they had reason until their death, they were soldiers. And they woke up in the morning and they knew exactly what their day was going to hold. And they knew exactly what they were aiming for, the glory of Rome. And it probably gave them a lot of clarity and strength and a deep sense of purpose. But what is left of Rome today? What is left of the Roman Empire? Ashes and artifacts. That's it. A few ancient buildings. Rome has been lost to history. And so their transcendent purpose turned out not to be so transcendent after all. And the same is true of every single noble cause. All of us will die. Your political party will disappear. Your church will close. The pursuit of justice is also temporary because every victim and every perpetrator will also fade away into history. Ecclesiastes, again, begins with these words. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The word translated vanity there is the Hebrew word hevel. And another definition for it is pointlessness. So in other words, he's saying pointlessness of pointlessness. Everything is pointless. We work and we try, but everybody dies and the world spins on. So noble causes aren't enough. The other problem with making a noble cause the foundational purpose of your life is B. 
they cannot hold the weight of becoming our ultimate purpose. I'll explain that. They can't hold the weight of becoming our ultimate purpose. They can't hold the weight of becoming our ultimate purpose. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. When we make a good cause or any earthly thing the primary focus and purpose of our lives, it eventually becomes less noble and less good. When we elevate it onto a pedestal that it doesn't belong on, it corrupts us and it corrupts itself in the end. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's take family. Family is maybe the most noble cause most of us can think of. It's important and it's blessed and it's meaningful in the right context. But if you make your kids or your spouse the primary purpose of your life, you will ruin them and they will ruin you. You won't discipline them right. You won't seek their joy and well-being right. You'll, you'll sacrifice things you shouldn't. You might find yourself falling into sin for their sake. When your kids get older, you might fear losing them so much that you will smother them. Or if, God forbid, you lose them, then what? And what are you? Why go on living? Or here's another example. Country. Patriotism is a good thing, I think. Defending your neighbors and your friends and your place in the world and your way of life, that's good. But history has shown us that patriotic zeal can very quickly become genocidal nationalism if it's not reined in. Otherwise, good people sometimes murder and pillage in the name of fatherland because country alone is not enough to be the purpose of your life. It's a very poor God. And so even a noble cause cannot be the purpose of your life. It will crumble under that weight and become something else entirely. Okay. So survival is not enough. Self is not enough. Others are not enough. No cause is noble enough. And so, so many people are still desperate for purpose. We want to know why we were made, and we want to live into that. And what I want to tell you this morning is that we can know, and we do know, that you and I were made for the glory of God. That's number four. We were made for the glory of God. And everything before this is really just a long introduction to show you all the ways that all of our other attempts at purpose fail and fall short because we were actually made for a reason, and that is the glory of God. It is the real purpose of our lives. And we know this because our Creator has said in many different ways, this is why I made you. Genesis 1, 26-27. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. The image of God is this deep theological well that we're not going to go too deep into this morning, but that is the foundation of what purpose is. It's the essence of identity. We were made to reflect and to act out and to image God. That's part of what that means. The Hebrew word translated image is tselem. And it's the same word used for idol in the Old Testament. Or statue or figurine. We were made as idols of God. And the very purpose of an idol is to represent and to encapsulate and reflect in a material way the immaterial essence of divinity, right? So you, you would, they would make these idols of their false gods so that they had something to look at. But God says, you don't do that for me. That's the second commandment. And so he says, you are my image. And that's not to say that we are gods. We're humans. We are humans. But we were made to uniquely express and proclaim and reflect the glory of the one who made us. But also in our consciousness and our reason, we were made to be in a relationship with God. We are not robots or inanimate objects. God made us to know him and to be known by him. And he has told us that that is why we exist. And that's the essence of our purpose. Because the thing's purpose is not and cannot be determined by the thing itself. 
The real purpose of a thing can only be determined by the one who made it. That's the, the idea of purpose, that it's made for something, to do something, to accomplish something. Stonehenge, I, I think of when I think of purpose, because it's this crazy prehistoric thing in England. It's mysterious. It's massive. Some of the stones at Stonehenge weigh 25 tons. And they're set up in this big circle, and nobody knows why. Nobody knows why. Experts have theories, and they've discovered some interesting things about how Stonehenge works with the sun and the stars and the shadows that it casts at certain times of year. But there's really only one group of people who know why it exists, the people who built it, and they're gone. And so we're grasping at why this thing exists, but we don't and probably never will know its actual purpose. And so many people treat human beings the same way. We say, well, we're just, we just got to figure it out. But we know because the one who made us has told us we are not alone in discovering our purpose. Our maker has revealed us to us why it is that we exist. Here's another passage that says this so clearly. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And yes, that is out of context, but... I think it still applies because this comes at the end of a long conversation about meat sacrificed to idols. The people in, in Corinth have been rescued from a terrible pagan system. And basically every meat that you could buy had been sacrificed to an idol as part of its being butchered. Like that's what they would do. These, these pagan temples sometimes were really almost like butcher shops where they would go, sacrifice the animal, carve it up, and then go sell it. And so some of the people there were like, we can't eat this. This has been sacrificed to a false god. And the Apostle Paul tells them, no, no, no. What is meat? What is the idol? Like, don't worry about it. However, don't violate your conscience if you really feel so worried. Because there were other people who had no problem going to the temple. They'd go into the temple, do all the pagan stuff, you know, worship the false god, and they thought that was fine. And so you have some people who had become vegetarians because they felt like all the meat was corrupted. And other people who, they didn't change anything when they came to Christ. And he says, here's the, here's the uniting principle. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. He makes an appeal to the very purpose of our existence. But he also reveals to us this blessed truth that we can and should try to do everything in our lives in a way that brings glory to God. A few more questions we have to answer. What is the glory of God? What does that even mean? Maybe you've wondered that, because we talk about that a lot, the glory of God. But we rarely try to define it. But we need to know what it is. The greatest preacher that I've ever heard talk about God's glory is John Piper. It's one of the focuses of his ministry. And so I'm going to start with his definition, because I love the way that he, he, he says it. He says, the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. In other words, God's glory is more than his beauty. It's the, it's the shining forth of all that God is and does. And it is the expression of every way that he is perfect. If you've ever looked up at the night sky... And seen the stars, the real stars, not the Azel stars, but like the out in the desert where there's no light pollution, where you look up and you think, am I on a different planet kind of stars? Have you seen those stars where you can see the outlines of galaxies? You can see a million tiny points of light. And it takes your breath away because of how amazing it is, or it does me. Remember, God takes Abraham out and says, Abraham, look up at the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. Because you or I, honestly, if God took me outside of my house and said, look at the sky and count the descendants, it'd be like, uh, 14. But no, no. The, the point that God was making is there are more than you could ever count. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And I promise you that that is not talking about the blue sky because there's nothing exciting about the blue sky. It's talking about the heavens, the stars. And the point is made like this in Hebrews 3, 3 through 4. Excuse me, let me say this. You know, Psalm, Psalm 19, 1 is telling us 
that that amazing sky is declaring the glory of God who made it. And if it is that glorious, how glorious is God? Psalm, excuse me, Hebrews 3, 3 through 4. I skipped that. Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And so the glory of God is greater than the stars of the sky. It is the shining forth of his holiness, his power, his justice, his grace. And so that's the glory of God. So now then the question is, how do we live for the glory of God? What does it mean that our purpose is the glory of God? And I think that answer is tied up in that verse from Psalm 19 that we just read. Because the stars, just by doing star things, glorify God. And stars only do one thing. They shine. And so I think the answer for us is similar. That humans then glorify God by doing what God made us to do. And as, as we said, we were made in His image. We are the idols, the representatives, the, the, the image, the figures of God Himself. In other words, as we obey God, as we worship Him, as we seek Him and thank Him, that glorifies Him. But the first answer to the question, how do we live for the glory of God, really is this. We have to seek forgiveness in Jesus. Seek forgiveness in Jesus. Because there's a wrinkle in this. Sin has broken our ability to glorify God. Romans 3.23 says this explicitly. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were supposed to shine forth God's glory like a mirror to reflect the glory of God to the world around us. But sin has caused all of us to fall short. And as we have chosen over and over and over again not to glorify God but to idolize lesser things and to pursue worldly lusts and put aside our true purpose, we have failed. And that failure is so serious that it killed us spiritually and it earned us a physical death as well. And that's why Jesus came. God in the flesh lived perfectly, glorified God exactly as he was supposed to, exactly as we were supposed to. And then he died the death that we deserved, which he did not. And rose again so that we could live and not just live to ourselves, but live in a way that actually glorifies God. We now have a chance to be redeemed and cleansed like a mirror that is dirty to be washed and to be actually able to glorify God. That's what the next verse says. Romans 3, 24 says we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine patience he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. By faith, recognizing that we haven't and cannot glorify God in our own sinful flesh, and by believing that Jesus died and rose again to make us new, and by asking for his help and his grace and his forgiveness, we can start to actually glorify God again and start to live into our true purpose. But it starts there. It starts there. And since Jesus is the only perfect human who's ever lived, then he's also the, the only example of what it is to be perfectly human, to bear the image of God and to glorify him rightly. That's what Jesus prayed in John 17, 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And then he also told us how we're supposed to do this. And so that's the next answer to the question, how do we live for the glory of God? Well, we must align our hearts and our minds and our actions to the aim of glorifying God. Our hearts, our minds, and our actions. Hearts, minds, and actions. Because it's one thing to know your purpose and it's another thing to actually pursue it. It's really difficult to say, I exist for the glory. Excuse me, it's very different to say I exist for the glory of God than it is to actually go and live your life in a way that actually glorifies Him. Because when we ask, why do I exist? We're not just asking a a mental question. We're asking a practical one. What what, what I want to know when I say, why am I here? Is what am I supposed to do? And Jesus answers that. When the lawyer comes and asks him which commandment is the greatest, Jesus says, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
or maybe not easy, that's simple. And so to live for the glory of God means that we have to turn our whole selves toward God in love and in worship and in reverence and in obedience. And we do everything with the aim of glorifying Him. And that includes whatever you do, right? As we read in 1 Corinthians, everything you do can be an act of glorifying God. It can include every noble cause that we read, family, justice, company, country, whatever it is, whatever good thing you pursue in the name of Jesus for the glory of God, that is good. And, And it gains a new character when we stop doing things for their own sake and we start doing them for the glory of God. And what's crazy and cool and exciting is that we can do whatever we do for His glory. It's not, it's not like just going to church glorifies God and that only prayer glorifies God and only singing songs of praise glorifies God. We can do the normal, everyday activities of life in a way that glorifies God. Maybe you have a job that you hate that just feels meaningless. Or maybe you're retired and you don't have a job at all anymore and you think well I just don't have a purpose no no every single thing you do can gain an eternal purpose if you do it for the glory of God Colossians 3 23 and 24 whatever you do work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward you are serving the Lord Christ so you take your mind and your heart and you wrestle them into submission with the word of God because you matter and you still bear his image, and your job is not your purpose, and leaving a legacy is not your purpose, and building and doing important things is not your purpose. Your purpose is to glorify the one who made you. And you can do that by washing the dishes to the glory of God, or by caring for your wife to the glory of God, or by praying for other believers to the glory of God, or by working the job you hate with a Godward heart for the glory of God. You can even glorify God by resting well. Because remember, God took a day off after creation to set an example for us that we need to rest. God does not want us to work and work and work until we fall over dead. Because then we're not of much use when we're dead. But getting the rest you need so that you can be most effective in life is glorifying God. You can take an eternally important nap if you do it with the right heart and mind. And with the right motive Not out of laziness, but so that you're recharged and ready. So the point that I'm making here is that everything can be done for the glory of God. Now, not sin. Not sin. You can't sin for the glory of God. Do I need to say that? I hope not. But whatever good thing, or whatever normal thing, whatever neutral thing, you can, because Paul said you can eat and drink to the glory of God. If you thank God for it. If you bless Him as you enjoy it. Because Remember, God gave us all good things to enjoy. That's 1 Timothy 6. You exist for His glory. And you get to live into that if you want to. And every day that you wake up, you get to decide today. Or sometimes you got to do this like moment by moment. Because if you're like me, you go through your day. And as you check things off the list, and His life beats the joy out of you a little bit, you start to get into that survival mode. He's like, I'm just going to get to the end of the day. You don't have to do that. You can live for the glory of God in every moment. So in order to try and find true purpose, or really the only true purpose, is to seek to glorify God. And that means turning your whole person toward declaring the greatness of all that God is and does. It's obeying Him with your hands, with the mental intention of making Him great, as we worship him from a pure heart. So two questions quickly. Have you asked his forgiveness for the million ways that you failed to glorify him? Because that's the first step. Jesus died to buy your pardon and to redeem you from your failure so that you can actually live into your true purpose again. And if you have, and you have God's forgiveness, then are you striving to glorify God in everything You do. Do you realize that there is no distinction in your life anymore between what is sacred and what is secular? Because you are now the temple of God. Everything you touch becomes sacred in a real sense. You can glorify God with everything you do. 
So with that in mind, with him in mind, may we be what he has made us to be. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for giving us purpose. We thank you for making us for a reason. Lord, I ask today that this truth would would take root in our hearts. That we who call ourselves your people would live for you. God, that you would grant your purpose to every single thing in our lives. Lord, and if there's anything that we do that we know we can't do for your glory, would you help us to get rid of that thing and to not waste our time with worthless pursuits? God, would you rescue us from the temptation to hedonism? Would you rescue us from the temptation to self-idolatry? Would you rescue us from the temptation to idolize everything else? And would you take your rightful place on the throne of our hearts? God, would you grant us the clarity of mind and of heart to do all that we do for your glory and your name? Because that is why we were made. And we know that that is the only way that we will find our true purpose. And you and you alone. We love you. We need you. May we live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.